It's, it's a great pleasure to be here. I see so many old and new friends. And I have to say that when we think about making babies, you know, perhaps one of the first things we should acknowledge is that in the last century, there was this enormous breakthrough in terms of birth control. I mean, imagine our society today if women weren't able to regulate their birth control. But we're going to talk instead about um, things that are occurring here in the 21st century. And um, the issue about ART is also related to our whole healthy life and our aging. And in fact, this will note um, for Professor Hearn, birthdays are good for you. You know, the more you have, the longer you'll live. Um, but I want to speak a little bit about this revolution that's occurring in stem cells. You know, when, um, until Dolly was born, we all thought that time moved in one direction. That you started as gametes, you went through fertilization, you went through implantation, then you finally were born. If you were an academic, you got a grant or two, and then you died. And that things were a one-way trajectory from gametogenesis th through death. And what's amazing about Dolly is that they reverse time. They took a cell from a mammary gland. They put it into an unfertilized egg. And sort of like Ponce de Leon or whatever, they reverse time. And that's not supposed to happen in biology. And you'll hear more about this from Professor Trounsen. But this is opening up this enormous field of regenerative medicine where maybe we can reverse time, not just in a plastic dish, but maybe within our own bodies. Um, and we're learning about diseases that may be related to uh, that may have stem cell origins, and one of them appears to be cancers. And one of the problems with cancers when you're being treated is that it's a little bit like mowing the lawn if you have dandelions. It seems as if the radiation or the chemotherapy cuts off the bulk of the, the dandelion, but still the root, the stem cell, remains there. And, um, and the, the, the rates of curing cancers have gotten so good that now there's a whole field on survivors of cancer. Now, obviously, if you're a man who's being treated with a cancer um, therapy that might induce infertility, you could collect the sperm ahead of time and then preserve fertility. But with a boy, there's a bigger problem because he hasn't yet gone through puberty. And so I want to speak with you a little bit about how we can take stem cells and using one of two methods, theoretically, isolate the spermatogonial stem cells from a boy before he's treated with cancer therapies, and then in principle, transplant them back into his own testes after he's um, been cured and gone through puberty, or directly generate a sperm cell and use that sperm-like cell for fertilization. So in one case, and this is work we did in collaboration with Kyle Orwig and Shukrat Militipov, um, and it's schematic, schematically diagrammed here where you see some parents of a young boy who are very worried. They're speaking with their oncologist, and the oncologist is explaining that the treatment, while it has a good chance of curing the boy, may render him infertile. And she recommends that he has a testicular biopsy. The cells that will ultimately become the sperm in his mature testes are frozen down. He then is treated, cured from the cancer. And then um, he goes to maybe the University of Melbourne, God forbid, Monash. But um, <laughs> he goes uh, through some university, establishes his career, and then later, these frozen spermatogonial stem cells, these are cells that are not yet sperm. These are cells that will become sperm after he goes through puberty, are reintroduced um, by ultrasound, and you can tell everything's happy because the kid has a balloon. And this is his biological child. Please don't believe that a schematic diagram is reality in 2014, right? I mean, this. This is forward-looking. We, we've replicated much of this, except by the Monash University business, in monkeys. And um, then there's another technique where, in principle, whoops, sorry, wrong direction, um, where, in principle, what we've done is we've taken human embryonic stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells from men, we've cultured them, and we've directly made 
spermatogenic cells. So we've had cells that had no haploid DNA, that is they had the full amount of DNA, whereas sperm are haploid, and um, after culturing them in a spermatogonial stem cell culture, in these human sperm, we've made roughly 4% of the cells to be sperm-like. Actually, they become round spermatids for the um, experts in the audience. And so what we've been able to do with human cells is taken fibroblasts, made stem cells from them, and in a culture, we've been able to make about 4% of those cells to be early precursors of sperm. They're haploid, they're properly imprinted, but we know that they won't be yet useful for infertility purposes, in part because we've worked with monkeys. Doing ART with monkeys is similar to doing ART with humans, except the reimbursement's a little bit different, but you do get the, res the benefit of naming them. So we've worked with testicular sperm and we've made Tess and Tickler. <laughs> Um, we've worked with elongated sperm and we have LZ, but in humans and in monkeys, you can't use these round spermatids. I should also mention that a group from Sato and Hayashi have done similar things with mice, including they can make eggs in vitro with a little bit of transplantation in a dish. So that means that we can take skin cells, turn them into pluripotent stem cells, and make both sperm and eggs in a dish. And it leads to this slide where you can see Noah and all the animals are depressed. And he says, nope, we're only taking tissue samples. And most zoos now are saving tissue samples because there is a theoretical possibility of preserving endangered species. Now I want to switch over for a couple of minutes because these methods for producing sperm-like cells in a dish, I don't think will ever be safe clinically. I don't think that we'll ever be able to properly replicate nature in a plastic dish and make healthy sperm in a dish. However, I do think we may be able to try to understand some of the root causes of male infertility, or maybe even discover what methods for treating cancers that don't destroy the male germ cells, and so there will be ways of moving forward here. I sort of like this slide on the genetics of male infertility. When I was a student back in Berkeley in the last millennium, we learned that, that the genetics of infertility was that if your grandparents didn't have children and your parents didn't have children, the likelihood was that you weren't going to have children. <laughs> but um, I don't want to spend too much time on that. But, there are methods that have been developed over the last several years that are truly remarkable. And perhaps most remarkable is ICSI, which is a very significant advance. So in this method, you aspirate a single sperm into a needle. Ever since Bill Clinton left office, we don't use the verb suck anymore. Um, but um, you then hold a, um, uh, my apologies, you hold a, um, the egg in a, uh, whoa, uh, I hope that's not me. Um, the, anyway, the sperm gets injected into the egg and remarkably um, development starts. And what's so special about this technique is you can have a handful of sperm and, and still end up with offspring. It's really quite, quite amazing. And um, in some ways, it's almost remarkable that it works so well. Um, and this technique has been used to now theoretically help women who have mitochondrial diseases. And I think all of you know that you get your mitochondria from your mother. Um, I understand that Father's Day is, a, is about to occur here in Australia. Um, it's the first sa Sunday in, in September. And I'd like you to remember, and you'll hear more of this from Professor O'Brien, that your father makes a number of absolutely irreplaceable contributions. Um, and one of those happens to be this centriole. And so in the spirit of gender equity, if you remember your mother on, if you remember your mitochondria on Mother's Day, please remember your centrioles on Father's Day. So here's a human egg in which a sperm has entered, and you can see the two centrioles came from the father, these two green dots. And again, here's a human egg where two sperm have entered. You can see two sperm tails, and you have four centrioles, each from the two um, uh, sperm. And we've also examined what happens between the difference, what's, what's different between 
um, fertilization by ICSI versus IVF. And it, it seems as if that there are some unknown factors that allow us to select, that allow nature to select the best sperm um, that allows uh, to get into the egg, whereas by IVF, an andrologist, embryologist looks at the audience and says, ooh, that's a cute one, and then uses that one. <laughs> we also found that there, if there's foreign DNA on the surface of the sperm, that DNA can be transferred into the egg during ICSI. We call this potentially um, infectious route immaculate infection. Um, and you can see that the, uh, the sperm DNA is actually coming into the egg. In my last couple minutes, I, I want to pose the question about whether or not we're, we're rolling dice with some of our ART um, techniques. And, and I have to say this, um, you know, I've suffered myself for, from infertility. One of my favorite great nephews is from surrogacy. There's all sorts of different um, things in my family I never thought I would experience, and the world is changing a great deal. And so I, I, I'm grateful that we're in the 21st century and that we have all these modern medical advances. And obviously people don't go through ART for recreational purposes, right? I mean, if you can use champagne and chocolate, you prefer that. Um, <laughs> And, and here, I think you're all blessed to be in Australia. As far as I can tell, the ART that's offered in Australia is truly at the, the top of the world, and it's also cost-effective and highly um, successful, and I think you should all be very proud. Now, there are methods that are coming along that cause me to worry. A few years ago, we made the first transgenic monkeys, and we did this by putting a... Um, a, a replication defective retrovirus into the egg and then once this retrovirus came into the egg, the RNA of the retrovirus gets reverse transcribed into double-stranded DNA and then ultimately we, um, we inseminated this by um, by ICSI, here's a single strand of DNA and then there'll be a second strand of DNA and um, this gets inserted into the maternal blueprint of the egg because the egg is arrested at second meiotic metaphase, which is a, um, just a technicality. But so we know that we're putting this gene into the uh, egg's DNA, which is arrested at the second meiotic spindle. We now came back and did ICSI. And I sort of wish I had the Jaws theme song for this animation because you'll see that the sperm moves just like um, a jaw, uh, the, the shark, but regardless, the egg develops. And what worries me about this technique, excuse me, is that colleagues in China now have used a very sophisticated method called CRISPR, which is remarkably effective for genetically modifying almost any cell. And um, we're already beginning to see from some clinics that are suggesting that you can choose the IQ of your offspring. And so if you want to be uh, your offspring to have 130 IQ, they can become an attorney, a chemist, an executive. Obvi unfortunately, none of us are on this list. Um, if if uh, instead you want to have a slow, simple offspring, let's see, they'll have 30 years of poverty, and 32 illegitimate, no, that's 32%, it's not children. But what's amazing to me is that you can already see slides suggesting that you can dial up or dial down the IQ of your offspring, and this is nonsense. This is absolute nonsense, but it causes me to um, worry and the whole field to worry. And I know that what we're gonna talk about today involves a certain amount of religious and ethical uh, vantage points, and. I, I like this slide because it highlights for me how our background influences what we see. If you show this slide to children, they see nine dolphins. See, there's a dolphin here and a dolphin here. It's only people with filthy minds. I think I can include Professor Trounson in this. Alan, do you see any dolphins? No, but it's amazing how it's our faith and tradition, and it doesn't matter how we're raised and how we abide by our tradition. See, people are trying to find the dolphins back there. <laughs> but it's amazing how when we come into fields like this that are so highly charged, 
it's important, to, I think, to understand another person's viewpoint rather than to convert the, uh, the uh, you know, infidels or whatever. And so let me just end by saying that, you know, thankfully we have many, many million of children on earth by ART. We don't have many surprises. And I think this is a, a great field. And um, let me just stop here and um, turn it over to the next speaker.